Let's get started. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Erica Quach, Program Officer at the National Committee on US-China Relations. First and foremost, I hope everybody is doing well during these uncertain times, especially those calling in from the West Coast and the Gulf Coast. I hope everybody is safe. As usual, we have disabled the chat function. So if you have any questions throughout the program, please submit them using the Q&A feature below. And with that, I am delighted to hand it over to National Committee Vice Chair Evan Greenberg. Hope you all enjoy the program. Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. You know, we're, we're privileged to host what I am sure will be an insightful dialogue between Lionel Barber, former editor of the Financial Times and Ambassador Bob Zalek, to mark the occasion of Bob's new book, America in the World, a History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. Bob Zalek is well known to all of you. I have known him for many years, beginning when he was U.S. Trade Representative and was awfully kind and patient with me as I was pounding the table for U.S. access for insurance. He's deeply experienced and insightful diplomat, policymaker, leader, and geopolitical thinker who has dedicated his life in service of his country and for a vision of a better world. He has distinguished himself throughout his career by translating perspective and knowledge into strategy with clear objectives and a practical plan of action. His book is another step in his contribution to our nation focused upon lessons of diplomacy and statecraft as practiced in the cause of our national interest at seminal moments by great American leaders we all know and admire. The National Committee on U.S.-China Relations is dedicated to the fostering of relationship between our two nations, a mission to foster people-to-people -people relations through dialogue and understanding and shared experiences this conversation between Bob and Lionel at this moment, in my judgment, is quite fitting. A chance to gain insights and perspective from Bob's writing as we imagine the task in front of our country to find our way to a coherent strategy as respects China, with clear objectives and a practical set of actions that better serve our nation's interests. Lionel Barber has dedicated his career to reporting on global geopolitical, geoeconomic, and global affairs. Lionel has been witness to many important moments and interviewed dozens of public and private sector leaders. Bob and Lionel have known each other for many years. I can think of no one better to conduct this interview and dialogue. And finally, if you haven't yet purchased Bob's book, please buy many copies and share them with those you love. Following their discussion, there will be time for Q&A. And with that, let me turn it over to Lionel. Thank you, Evan. Uh, and let me just say what a pleasure it is um, to be here tonight virtually and to resume the conversation with my old friend and mentor, Bob Zellick, who I first met in the State Department in 1989 in the early spring when many commentators said there was no American foreign policy for dealing with Mr. Gorbachev or Europe or Germany. And as I found, he was a great practitioner and thinker, thinker uh, in those early days. Now, his book, America in the World, is to my mind, uh, and I don't say this lightly as a former journalist, uh, it's a masterpiece. It's a brilliant book which is about actors and about ideas. And one of the things that strikes me is that it features people we don't often hear a great deal about. Evans talked about great Americans. We often think about presidents, but one of the strengths of this book is, is that it features characters we've not heard so much about. Um, Charles Evan Hughes, um, John Hay, um, Elihu Root, and many others. The second point is he is a practitioner, as Evan uh, alluded. He's been at the coalface. So let me start, um, Bob, by asking you 
this is a formidable uh, enterprise to, to actually write a history of American diplomacy. Why did you to choose to do this? Um, and how difficult did you find it? Well, Evan and, and Lionel, first, let me thank both of you for hosting me. Uh, this is a great forum, a great opportunity. Appreciate your kind words. Um, so probably like uh, most people uh, at this event, um, I read some 25 years ago, Henry Kissinger's book, Diplomacy. And I enjoyed the way that Dr. Kissinger used history to talk about foreign policy. But I always had a sense it was written from a European perspective. So for some decades, I've been thinking, how would I try to do something analogous, <coughs> but drawing in American ideas uh, and experience? And as you, as you kindly mentioned, uh, in between, I actually had some additional service to do. But <laughs> when I got done with that, um, I thought the best way to do so was to focus on, on stories. I, people always enjoy stories. And so it also gave a sense of people, which would appeal to people interested in biographies. But I wanted to focus particularly on, on episodes and the practical side of policymaking. What I wanted to bring here was a lot of foreign policy now is taught through international relations theory in universities. And that's all well and good, but it didn't seem very relevant to the work that I had done, or if you're facing challenges of German unification or rising China or trade issues, it, it, uh, it's good background, but it's not really at the heart of the issue. And so I wanted to return to a field I'd always enjoyed reading, which is diplomatic history, which I had started in university. And as some people may know, that field is somewhat faded uh, in, in the academy. Um, in part for the understandable reason that uh, people have wanted to bring in underappreciated actors and, and players' perspectives. Um, and that's made a richer context, but I think we've lost something. Um, Fred Logoval, who's a great historian up at Harvard, wrote a piece saying, why have we stopped teaching political history? So this is a way of trying to, in a sense, nudge back into that field. And in particular, um, I used to torture a lot of my younger colleagues, I guess, over the years by asking them historical questions. And insofar as they did have historical background, they really start with World War II. they very little understanding of the first 150 years of American history. And there's a lot of rich characters and, and lessons to be learned there. And so I guess the, the thought was, uh, after the service I've had and given my interest in history, could I prod along what might be a a changing discipline of applied history. How can we think about using history to solve problems? Uh, and each chapter, as you know, in some ways is a case study. Yeah. Bob, um, we're going to come to the present and the present challenges of American foreign policy a little later. Um, but I want to start with two characters from the 19th century who I think are extremely revealing. Um, one is at the beginning, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and without preempting what you're going to say, I think one of the strengths of this book is you do connect domestic politics, economics, trade, security in a way that is rare in contemporary uh, history. And I think the other character is John Hay of the open door policy, where there's a China connection. But first, let's take Hamilton uh, and why you think he was such an important uh, character in the early days of the Republic and the formation of a foreign policy? Well, I'm sure this didn't escape you, uh, Lionel, but it wasn't totally an accident. After the introduction, which focuses on Benjamin Franklin, another wonderful uh, individual, I started with a Treasury Secretary as opposed to a Secretary of State. And uh, Hamilton is the father of economic statecraft for the United States. Many people know about his role in developing the American financial system. But the story I wanted to tell was what was the diplomatic corollary to that financial and economic system? But he also, he had a larger view of the world. He, he at the same time he was trying to develop, uh, solve economic problems, he had an idea of systems of financial and economic power. And in fact, he draws particularly from the Bank of England but where for the Bank of England, some of the social and political and economic effects were incidental to its creation, Hamilton has the idea that these will be part of building the new American system. He also has a keen sense 
of financial credit and, and war. So in 1781, uh, before the Battle of Yorktown, war still raging, he, he heads off to the library of his father-in-law and he's trying to understand what is the nature of this conflict with Britain. And he basically recognizes it's a war of attrition. And part of that will be the credit for Britain to continue to fight the war as well as the willpower. And this affects his later thinking when he becomes treasury secretary. He realizes in the financial world, it's not just money, it's confidence. And so uh, one, I think, underappreciated aspect when he builds the system is he wants to move fast because he wants to establish confidence and credit in, in the new United States. And of course, this is a wonderful irony in that one of his great foes is Thomas Jefferson. And when Thomas Jefferson uh, in the next chapter wants to buy Louisiana, he would not have been able to do so except for the treasury bonds that Hamilton had created. And by the way, with a constitutional interpretation. So you have the constitution, you have financial system, but also uh, Hamilton had a strategic outlook. So he's an economic player, but sees the bigger picture. Um, he understands the United States as part of a wider Atlantic world. This is, people often in Europe refer to the American isolationism. Uh, Hamilton was the furthest you can imagine from that. Um, he also had a sense of the United States as a land and maritime power. So he's focused on the Mississippi River Valley, which now we consider to be the heartland of America, but at that time was our second seacoast, or, or at least water coast. He also has a shrewd sense of balance of power politics. So amazingly, Talleyrand, a great figure from Europe, is in the United States at this time. And, and Talleyrand says, uh, Hamilton divines Europe. And what he means by that is he understands the power forces within Europe. Now, as part of this, Hamilton launches a strategic, what we would today call a strategic dialogue uh, with Britain. And it's an amazing thing because he's basically saying to London, look, you know, we fought with the French, but we think in English. We're part of your world. We could fit within the British mercantile structure if you treat us with respect, you recognize our economic interests, you get your forces to leave the forts. And uh, ironically, uh, Lord Shelburne, who was the first minister of Britain at the time of the American Peace Treaty, has a similar idea, but the politics in the United States and Britain won't, survive, won't be able to support okay. it. So you have about a, a hundred years early, the notion of a special relationship. And then I would just say, because of that, he moves to a policy of neutrality in the, for the United States. And here is where this pragmatic thesis that I keep emphasizing has a key role. Um, remember about 90% of the federal government's revenues were from customs. So if you're gonna pay your debt, if you're gonna pay your government, you can't kill off your, your trade system. And I guess the last thing I'd say about Hamilton was that he, he had a view of a policymaker that I would recommend to anybody today, which is number one, you shape events. You don't just wait for them. And he draws that, by the way, from the experience of Colbert, the, the French treasury minister. He also says he, he manages to perceive the whole as well as the system of parts and how they relate. And the last point, which he shares with Franklin, um, is the notion that while you can approach all these topics rationally, the emotions of people matter and small gestures can have large effects right. on great people and events. Okay, uh, we've got a, quite a few characters to get through, Bob. So let's just, 100 years on, manifest destiny. The frontier has moved all the way to California and America is not, a, not quite perhaps a great power, but is looking outwards. Uh, you've had the Spanish War um, in 1898, and then a character becomes Secretary of State called John Hay and takes a particular interest in China and avoiding what he refers to as the spoilation of um, China by outside powers. Let's talk about Hay and why his so-called open door policy was so important. Well, uh, this audience may know, but John Hay was a personal assistant to, uh, to Lincoln. So he's a man that, that comes from the Civil War and a sense of tragedy. He was allegedly Queen Victoria's favorite ambassador because he had a wonderful sense of history and perspective. He was a wonderful writer. But in 1900, as, as you mentioned, he's the father of what Americans know as the open door policy. And the reason I wanted to put in this chapter is that 
sometimes Americans have come to think that foreign policy can only be conducted if we're in a position of total domination. Well, this is really a chapter about limited aims without overwhelming power. And his basic aims are, how do we prevent the carve up of China, like Africa had just been carved up by colonial powers? And how do we maintain uh, commercial access? So the open door notes fundamentally try to find the common ground in other countries' positions, build on it slightly, and hold it together with the modest gravity of international cooperation. He's shaping the foreign policy landscape for the future, and his ideas obviously show up over the course of, of coming decades. What, of course, is also an interesting part of the story from where you sit is the notion of the open door actually comes from some British friends. So there's the role of international idea merchants, and it's part of the American experience of drawing on those ideas and customizing them. And I guess with Hay, I'd close that I think the 1900 experience is the start of three themes that uh, sort of guide American engagement with China for until today. One theme is the great commercial opportunity. You know, sometimes a shining star just over the horizon, but to be fair, China was the fastest growing export market for the United States for 15 years until the Trump administration. The second was the notion of China being a power or potential power on the world stage. So in 1900, the goal was don't allow it to be carved up like Africa. In the 1920s, it was how do we try to help a Republic of China sort of stand on its own two feet. Uh, FDR obviously had the notion of China or being one of the four horsemen. Uh, Nixon and Kissinger obviously look upon China as part of their triangular diplomacy. And you could argue onto my era where the responsible stakeholder was how do you integrate China into the international system? So that's the second thing. But the third theme is also important. This is an era where the, much of the United States and British interaction with China was through the missionary movement. And I think what you've seen with American policy towards China for over a century is the notion that we wanted to convert the Chinese, <laughs> whether it was to Christianity, uh, whether it was to capitalism, whether it was to be a small R republic. And what we've encountered is when China decides to go another direction, as they did in the Boxer Rebellion, uh, as they did in 1949, as they did in 1989, perhaps as they're doing today, then the sense of rejection is all that much sharper because you've, you, in a sense, opened your door to somebody that you believe you're trying to bring into your system and they decide they wanna go on a different path. And so you've seen a pendulum in US relations with China in part with deep engagement and then a sense of rejection. And perhaps the lesson from that is we need to consider China as it is, not just as we wish it to be. Let's turn to uh, Kissinger and Nixon. I detected a certain ambivalence um, towards Kissinger, maybe as you say, too European, uh, too much real politic and not enough values. But let's just look at the China opening. In retrospect, was it such a brilliant strategic move? How do you assess it today? Yes, I think it was. Again, you always have to look at historical events in the context. And Haldeman in his diaries wrote that throughout the Nixon administration, you needed to keep in mind that Vietnam was the ghost that haunted the room every day. And, and one has to recognize for Nixon and Kissinger, what they're fundamentally trying to do is uh, maneuver into a new policy out of a retreat. And, and managing retreats is always perhaps the, the most difficult endeavor. So uh, as, a, as a logic, I talk about the principle or the idea of real politic. Um, and Nixon and Kissinger um, were trying to seek a new balance of power based on sort of a new multipolarity. Um, their triangular diplomacy is often misunderstood and I try to explain how they executed that. Um, but their bigger goal was, was also avoid great power war and avoid isolationism, which they were deeply concerned about uh, after the Vietnam War. Nixon also, in some ways, brings a perhaps less recognized big picture view to the partnership. He, want, he saw the opening to China as a way to regain the initiative. Um, he wanted to, he believed that audacity would, and boldness would help win uh, public support. And he had this wonderful phrase that I think applies today too, which is, 
great nations that, that no longer pursue large goals cease to be great. And I think that was part of his notion at the time. I think where, where they failed to recognize some of the other traditions of American diplomacy was number one, you can see throughout their thinking, they never fully realized the economic and technological power of the United States and the resilience. Ronald Reagan was quite the opposite of this actually. Um, and so they, they're trying to create a stability. And one of my views is that in world order, in some ways, dynamism serves the United States as much as traditional stability. The United States historically has moved quite well with dynamic systems if we keep our head about us. They also tried to educate the American public about what they considered to be our historic bad habits. But this had an unfortunate sense of declinism, which Americans have never liked. And it was the notion that these skilled manipulators would help us use our limited power uh, to, to effect. Um, there's a wonderful little aspect of this. If you think about the key words associated with Nixon and Kissinger, detente, realpolitik, rapprochement, they're all foreign words. <laughs> they don't, those don't, those words you wouldn't necessarily see on Ronald Reagan's uh, sort of watch list. Um, but at the same time, I think the record demonstrates that, that Kissinger was a masterful negotiator. That I talk a lot about the Shanghai communique, his work with China. Um, you know, we take these things for granted now, but in the world of 1970, 71, this was a huge moment. I didn't have a chance to go into his work as much in the Middle East, but I think he also was quite effective there. But I guess my bottom line on this, going to your question, Lionel, is I think American diplomacy to be effective needs to have more of a blend. Um, in my chapter on John Quincy Adams, I refer to American realism. And it has some similarities of power politics to that which you see with Nixon and Kissinger. But John Quincy Adams also had a, a, almost a sort of a emotional tie to the notion of the American Republic and kind of what that stood for. He didn't feel necessarily that other regions of the world were ready for it, but it was as idealistic as some of the other discussions you might see either for uh, you know, George Bush or other promoters of, uh, of freedom and free societies. So part of the idea of the book, Lionel, is I'm not trying to so much say this one's right or this one's wrong. It, there, there's a pluralism of ideas of American diplomacy and Nixon and Kissinger definitely are on that, that list. Bob, let, let's move effortlessly into the 20, early years of the 21st century. Clearly at that moment, China joins the World Trade Organization and becomes, if you like, part a stakeholder, I'm borrowing your term, in the international system. Uh, you gave a very important speech to that effect and talked about um, the opportunities for, for both America and China and the world economy from this approach. Um, but there's a narrative now which says actually um, it never worked out and China is now building its own uh, multilateral institutions and you're seeing a divergence or a decoupling. Now, there's a lot of ideas there, but how would you first of all assess how your own stakeholder uh, approach has fared? And secondly, what lessons should we draw from, for, for, for a new approach to China? So uh, to start out, it gives me no comfort to say, but I'm not sure that either the United States or China are acting like responsible stakeholders today. Um, and we can see some of the dangers and effects that creates for the international system. If I, if I step back a little bit more historically, it's a, very rarely have people thought about this in the Chinese context. You know, if you're thinking about building peaceful world orders, as Nixon and Kissinger were trying to do, um, it certainly makes sense to try to take rising powers and integrate them in the system. It, or if you think, take uh, Europe after 1815, where one of the success was drawing defeated France into the system. Um, if you take Europe after uh, World War I, where one of the failures is to draw Germany into the system and Japan is drawn in economically until sort of the Great Depression. If you take 1945, one of the successes building a place for Germany and Japan. So from a simple historical logic, one would try to uh, integrate China into the system. 
And what I was trying to do in 2005 was actually uh, nudge to a, a higher level, a higher standard, because the integration had occurred. China was in the WTO, World Bank, IMF, UN Security Council, treaties from ozone depletion uh, or others. Um, and I think one of the unfortunate aspects of the current debate in the United States, and I think people in this audience are aware of my comment on this, is that um, there's a view that, that uh, cooperation with China failed. And that is just historically totally flat wrong. Um, on the details of this, I, will, I, I wrote an article in the National Interest um, earlier this year that kind of spells it out. But you know, keep in mind, in the year I was born, we were fighting a war with China in North Korea. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, we were fighting a war with one of the surrogates of Vietnam. Um, over part of this integration, China became quite eff effective in moving from being one of the world's worst proliferators to cooperation on missiles and weapons of mass destruction, whether it's Iran or North Korea. Um, on the economic topics, people forget that you know, China not only was the fastest growing export destination, but its current account surplus went from 10% to zero, meaning it added all that domestic demand. It quit manipulating its exchange rate. During the global financial crisis, it had one of the best sort of stimulations. Uh, in my experience at the World Bank, they were quite cooperative to work with. Uh, in, the, in the UN Security Council from 2000 on, there were I think about 190 resolutions and China was with the United States on 182 of them. Now that required US diplomacy, but I recall when I dealt with genocide in Darfur, the Chinese were actually quite cooperative and helpful in the Security Council and actually adding peacekeepers. I could go on and on, and, and frankly, to take a, a sensitive issue like Taiwan, you know, if you go back to the discussions that Nixon and Kissinger had, you might assume that Taiwan would not be quite as autonomous today as it, as it has turned out to be. And this policy of cooperation, and I was directly part of this, brought China into the W, or Taiwan into the WTO, brought it into APEC. Uh, I was actually also able to get an observer status in the WHO, all while doing arms sales. So the question that I would push to a lot of the new confrontationalists today is uh, not that, that uh, the diplomacy with China is, has been 100%. I mean, the, the challenge of diplomacy is that it never stops. There are many frustrations. But so how are you going to deal with the challenges of today without China? What do you want to accomplish? If you want to deal with pandemics or biological security, if you want to deal with climate change, inclusive economic growth, what's your plan to try to, to accomplish these? Now, at the same time, I think part of the realistic assessment is <clears throat> President Xi did change course with China. And from a historical perspective, I think you know, people in the United States and Europe tend to see the fall of the Soviet Union now as a historical event. In China, that event still casts a long shadow over the Communist Party. And you can see how it has led to a series of actions by Xi that I think have frankly not served China well and certainly haven't served its position in the world well. But to bring it forward today, Lionel, you know, in a sense, as opposed to just throwing verbal bombs or trying to believe that uh, we're gonna create a new Cold War, which by the way is I think a poor analogy for lots of reasons, um, <clears throat> We need to start at home. I mean, our best strength is what we do uh, stand for as a country and we're effective with science, technology, education, our society. We need to cooperate with allies and partners. And by the way, some of that will compromise because they certainly don't want to contain China if that's the idea of some people in the administration. Um, and then uh, your, your defense policies will certainly have to adjust. So my guess is, is that you know, our military are going to have to focus more on an anti-access area denial policy. I don't think we're planning to invade China in the events of sort of conflict. That requires a different force posture, not necessarily big aircraft carriers as targets, but probably a lot of undersea vehicles that are more sort of robots in a network fashion. And then on the economics, uh, my experience, Lionel, has been that there's a lot, there's a lot of ground for mutual interest. So let, let me be you know, very practical. Intellectual property rights, which has been a point of, of complaint. Well, China now has intellectual property rights courts where foreigners seem to win cases about 85 to 90 percent of the time, but the penalties aren't high enough. So frankly, I would try to negotiate higher penalties. The forced technology transfer issue. 
which is prohibited by China's WTO accession. Probably one of the major uh, causes of that are the joint venture requirements because it puts the temptations too much in front of the companies. So I would work to try to end a lot of the joint venture requirements. Um, and my point on this is, again, uh, not that everything is, is smooth, uh, but on the other hand, I guess I asked myself, Trump came into office saying his number one aim was to uh, drastically reduce the bilateral trade deficit. Well, we'll see this year he hasn't reduced it at all. In fact, it's probably gone up. And we have higher tariffs, uh, we have less sales. So following in the sense the thesis of my book, I, you know, I always say to yourself, so what is this exactly accomplished for the United States? And I see commentators say, well, we now see China as a threat. Well, that's nice. So, so there where you go from there. And I guess the last point I'd make on this is this, whether you call it a realistic, pragmatic approach, doesn't mean the United States needs to cede on fundamental values. So in Hong Kong today, for example, as opposed to sanctioning a bunch of officials so we can't talk to them, what I would do is what Britain has proposed to do, which is say, let people from Hong Kong come to the United States as well as Britain, Australia, and others. That shows the fundamental difference between the two societies. So I think- uh, By the uh, way, Bob, sorry to interrupt, but I was just gonna say that that's the single uh, only sensible foreign policy decision taken in the last year in Britain. But that's just a comment from me. Well, anyway, I think that I'll just close at this point. Um, I think, uh, frankly, the relations are in free fall. Um, it's not clear where the bottom is. I think it's quite dangerous. And I would feel a lot better if I felt that both countries were looking for off ramps. So we're not going to fundamentally go back to uh, the types of world that I was trying to create. But I will press people and say, how are you going to mention, deal with a lot of the problems that I have suggested are on the agenda if you make China into a foe? It's interesting. China is just recently talking about some economic infrastructure in Afghanistan to help with the deal with the Taliban. Well, why can't that serve our interests, right? And on the other hand, we see China doing more things with Iran. Well, is that a shock given how we're treating China? You know, so uh, this, is, this is where the pragmatic nature of diplomacy needs to be rediscovered. Yeah, um, I'm gonna turn this over to questions, uh, but I wanna have one more crack at this, Bob, and I don't wish to um, personalize matters, but it, it does seem to me that she is a different type of Chinese leader. Um, he, he's uh, broken the tradition of the two terms after Mao. Um, he has been uh, dropped all sense of, um, uh, well, he, he's been a great deal more assertive, uh, both at home and abroad. And the sense that the um, China would, if you like to coin Joseph Nye's phrase, be more like us the more it integrated into the world economy has just not proven to be true. Now, the problem is that we're now facing a, a, a situation where some commentators are treating the US-China relationship as a battleground throughout the world across all sorts of different areas from intellectual property to cyber to, to, to the South China Sea, to Charis and everything. So just a practical question. Um, just pretend that you've just been told quietly that you're the new national security advisor in the Biden administration. Um, what would your four point memo on China say? Well, I'd actually go back to <clears throat> some of the analogies in my book to when dealing with the Soviet Union, the United States started by strengthening its alliance relationships. And I think given the sorry state of those relationships, uh, the best way to do so would be leverage off what would probably be uh, the domestic agenda. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming this is not Trump because Trump will operate in a transactional other way. And look, one of the challenges will be um, an income, if Biden's elected, he's got a huge domestic agenda. He's got pandemic and trade healthcare system. He's got inclusive economic growth. He's got racism issues. He's got immigration issues, he's got environmental issues. And that's gonna limit his time internationally. But so I've written a piece in the uh, Foreign Affairs Online that said, why not leverage those points internationally? 
And I offered some ideas on how you could do that, take a pandemic. The big question will be, can we support the vaccines internationally? Can we do something like Bush 43 did with HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis? These are totally within America's capacity to do. But then I would connect those with my allies and in both Europe and Asia, which I think actually is a pretty good common basis. And then I'd use that foundation to deal with the two bigger issues, one of which you mentioned, the future of China, and the other is the future of free societies. So I, I would approach it uh, by first sort of building my base of support. And, and more particularly uh, on your, your, your point about Xi, I, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I, I use the story that when he took office, he created a film about the end of the Soviet Union and ordered it to be shown to all the party cadres. And it's such a film in Europe would have Gorbachev the hero. The Chinese version is Gorbachev is the person who abandoned the Communist Party, broke up his country, and it's not going to happen here. But we also have to be careful in while we uh, defend ourselves against espionage and other actions, we don't give up the openness of our own society that has been our fundamental strength. So I'm quite concerned about shutting off our universities. Frankly, you'll find a lot of Asian Americans and Chinese Americans that are now being subject to attacks. And I just think that's McCarthyism and a return to the wrong path for the United States. So the irony, Lionel, is in some ways, I think America ought to have a little bit more confidence about its own long-term capacity. And so in this, I will follow the Reaganite tradition, including on your point about China. I don't think the final chapter of China's story has been written yet. And I think that uh, we'll, we'll see what, if younger generations in China continue to have a competition among free societies, we'll see which looks better. Good. Um, well, we've got a lot of questions, Bob, and I'm not going to be able to get through them, but let me, there's a rather interesting um, question about cybersecurity. Why has this, this is from Gabby, why has cyber uh, and cybersecurity become such a contentious issue between the US and China and what can be done? So I think there are a number of fears here. Uh, one, uh, I think China made a mistake with the Made in China 2025 initiative. You'll, you'll find people in China, including, I had this conversation with Wang Qishan, who said, look, I haven't even read the report. And there's people who will say, it's the Ministry of Industry that was trying to position itself. But regardless of the logic, it scared people that China was gonna to try to dominate all the industries of the future. Then you combine that with the technological uh, espionage that has gone on. And, uh, and, and given sort of China's rise, one of the aspects that I think China has been uh, insensitive to is that uh, with its added power, actions that might have sort of been uh, at least passed by 10 or 20 years ago now look like bullying. And you see this in their relations with a lot of their neighbors as well. So um, frankly, on top of that, you add the fact that China's firewall uh, and uh, sort of splinter net already sort of created a break in a lot of the information technology space. And I think now the real danger is that uh, if, if all data, if all personalized data is seen as a national security issue without any recognition that one can manage these risks, we're really going to uh, disconnect across not only the information technology issue, but life sciences and any business sector that depends on big data. And I'm not sure the debate in the United States has recognized the full costs of that uh, to the United States as well. The irony is in part, you know, a lot of the data stories you can read in the newspaper each day, frankly, would apply whether the Chinese get access or anybody else gets access to it. I don't think the, the United States public has come to a full recognition of what sort of data about individuals is already available. And I think, frankly, we need better privacy and security systems uh, at, at home. Yeah. I mean, just, just on this decoupling question, how far could it go? How far have we gone towards decoupling and how far could it genuinely go, given the, the interconnectedness, which has been part of our lives in this last generation or two? Well, as I suggested, um, I think the, uh, uh, it, it, it's all going to be linked to data. 
And if any personalized data becomes a national security issue and people are unwilling to kind of manage the risks of that in di different forms, well then I think decoupling can go extremely far. Uh, now, uh, there still be basic uh, types of trade and commodity and interest. I mean, from uh, American farmers to other Chinese producers, I think the real question this is gonna present is whether not just with the United States and China, but from the rest of the world, whether companies are gonna to have to build separate systems. So frankly, I mean, I already know some European companies that operate in the United States and China and wanna to continue to operate in both, and they're gonna to have to think about whether they restructure themselves so yeah. as to separate that. And again, this, this goes to the larger point when I mentioned about the benefits of cooperation with China. People have taken a lot of the benefits for granted. And you know, if you're willing to live in a world with lower productivity, lower growth, greater poverty, a lot of problems in the developing world, political upheaval, okay, <laughs> but recognize what you're getting into here. I do think that people are gonna have to take sides, but I want to get to the questions. We have a, a, um, a far-sighted question here from Weikwan Gu of W. Gu Consulting. How long will America's position in the world last what are the three most likely scenarios for America's world, role in the world by the mid-century? Um, you've only got two minutes on this, by the way, Bob. But very briefly, how do you see that? It's quite an interesting thought. Yeah. Well, going back to my core point, uh, the, the real strength of the United States begins at home. So it depends on how we deal with some of the issues that, that are in the front page today, but also our manpower, how we one of my principles about can we see North America as an asset for a region. But if I, if I jump to the sort of the three scenarios, um, one scenario could look more like the world of 1900, um, where we have uh, a set of contending powers, although this time it would be China, US, India to a degree, Russia for geographic and some military reasons, European Union perhaps, uh, certainly for economic matters, uncertain about political and security matters. Japan sort of caught between the United States and, and China trying to work its way. Um, that's a very different world than we have today. And uh, all you have to do is think back to the world of 1900 to some of the risks that get presented by it. Um, another would be uh, a world that breaks up into, uh, in a sense, two contending blocks uh, and uh, I think it's gonna be harder for the United States to uh, sort of achieve what it wants in that world than some may think. Um, there's economic gravity and geography that will matter for a lot of people in East Asia that will not wanna cut off ties totally with China. And the third would be a United States that sort of goes back to some of its fundamental traditions and works as I've suggested from a North American base of partnership with alliance partners and understands win-win benefits of a international economic system that the Trump administration has done much to uh, deconstruct. Um, there are a number of questions from um, Gregory Brown from University of Central Missouri, um, Lucas Florsheimer from Pomona um, and others about the Trump administration. I mean, to, uh, and I know it's painful for you a bit to talk about this, but um, who, for someone who served in a number of Republican administrations. Um, but they come down to this, how much damage has been done in the last three and a half years and how easy is it to turn around? Well, I may be too close to it, uh, but I think a lot of damage has been done. Um, much of my book is also about the creation of this alliance order from 47 to 49 and it's yeah. The, the key notion is it's, it's not a traditional European alliance. It's political, it's diplomatic, it's an economic system. Um, I think uh, with the right leadership in the United States and public support, uh, you could restore a lot of the security arrangements in part because people don't have very good alternatives. I mean, you've, you've lived through 20 or 30 years of discussion of European defense and you know, how's that worked out, right? And if you're Japan or India or Australia, do you really want to forego the United States military support or, or South Korea? Um, I think the bigger question is on the economic system. Um, and here we have to also work in the effects of pandemic and sort of economic slowdown, but I, and, and importantly, sort of trading system. And I think that fabric has frayed much more. 
Um, could the United States uh, uh, sort of regenerate it? Of course it could. The United States has got a lot of sort of internal resiliency. And interestingly enough, if you look at the polls, for example, from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the American public is not against the types of policies that I've been talking about. Um, but it all does come down to leadership. And right now our leadership is heading us in an opposite direction. Let me pick up on a point. I, I, I think what one word we haven't used in this conversation, but which should come up is Congress. And I must say in the book, for example, uh, I think particularly in the Wil Woodrow Wilson chapter, you talk uh, in a very insightful way about uh, the, what can happen if you don't pay enough attention to Congress and you don't bring them in, whereas the contrast obviously being Truman and Vandenberg uh, uh, in after the Second World War. But if you look at um, a subject close to your heart, trade, I mean, the, the quotes free trade um, consensus and the bloc supporting open trade has really weakened progressively over the last 20, 30 years. And we now live in a tariff world. How easy is that to turn back and to recreate? It, it's not gonna be easy. Um, my own guess is that what's interesting is on the Democratic side, you see Democratic voters now pro-trade as the Republican voters have bought into the Trump idea. The business community in the United States still understands uh, the importance of it. Uh, my guess is, is that uh, on the Democratic side, if Biden wins, it'll be very important to see who's selected as U.S. trade representative, because you have to partly create a different coalition here. You have to take some of these younger voices that are interested in global cooperation on health and environment and link it to the trade issue. I think, the, for example, issues of carbon border taxes and others will have to be dealt with in that. Uh, and so it's one of those periods where you're probably going to need a bit of a paradigm shift. And that doesn't happen unless some leaders step forward. And I know people think this is old fashioned, but there's another story in my book that's worth bringing up on this. In, in 1947, when America supposedly reigned supreme in the global economy, and we could do as we wished, um, Will Clayton is trying to negotiate the launch of the GATT system in Geneva with 22 other economies, and Congress passes a 50% wool tariff. And Clayton comes all the way back to the United States to speak to Truman. Truman gives him 15 minutes, gives the Secretary of Agriculture 15 minutes. And I've been in a lot of meetings like this where the Secretary of Agriculture said, Mr. President, if you veto this bill, you'll lose up to seven or eight states in the 1948 election. And Clayton makes the case for having GATT go forward and the internet, the global recovery. Truman decides the next day he's going to veto the bill and even permit a 25% cut in the world tariff. Now, my point in telling that story is, and by the way, Truman, people who don't know the history, did win the 1948 election. Uh, and so, you know, it does come down to whether people are willing to step forward and play this leadership role. Your, your, you, your broader point about Congress, though, I just also want to touch on. It, you're right, through almost all these stories, and frankly, it's there in Franklin and Jefferson and Lincoln and Hay and all, you, you have the, the role of, of Congress and public opinion. And I guess one reason I wanted to do that is because, as you said, uh, Vandenberg's contribution was probably underappreciated. But think about people like John McCain or Richard Lugar or Sam Nunn, um, you know, and ask yourself who will be some of those people uh, in the future if there will be some. If you want to be optimistic, I would recognize there are a number of younger Congress people who served overseas either in the military or in the intelligence uh, other agencies. And perhaps they will understand that if the United States tries to retreat from the world, at the end of the day, it's going to hurt us. Yeah, there is a line, I think, in Present of the Creation, which is one of my favorite um, books on American foreign policy, Dean Etchison's memoir, where he does say that there is no natural constituency for foreign policy unless it's an agricultural tariff. Or, <clears throat> uh, and he, the story is, of course, of him developing a constituency that would support um, a whole new um, security order built largely around Europe. Um, can I ask, uh, uh, I'm just coming to another question here um, about COVID. Um, this is from Louise Smith from Harvey Mudd College. 
How has COVID-19 impacted the United States place in the world compared to many other nations? Our attempts to control the virus have been unsuccessful. Has this affected our role, America's role in global politics? Well, you know, you see it from Europe. I'm also in touch with people with Asia. I mean, the United States certainly has not come out as a shining example. Um, but I guess I would say, again, the story isn't fully written. And here's what I would point to. Vaccine development, uh, the US government has put a lot of money into this. My guess is that the vaccines that are gonna come out of this are gonna have a heavy US imprint. And it depends how we use that vaccine capacity. Um, second, uh, obviously it was foolish to withdraw from the WHO, but some people may know the second largest contributor to the WHO is the Gates Foundation. So when we think about the United States, we can't only think about the White House, we also have to think about the private sector, whether it be companies or foundations. And third, I think that, um, again, uh, the US could turn this around, uh, not just by rejoining the WHO, but also frankly, fixing some of its weaknesses. We could talk about why that sort of occurs. But I can imagine an initiative where, of course, you're gonna deal with the American citizens' needs first, but I think you could also really take an active role, as I said, Bush 43 did with the HIV AIDS, probably did more for our relations with Africa than anything over world history. But there's one other dimension I wanna draw into this. And I, I've actually, I've written an op-ed that may come out soon in a paper. I'm quite concerned about the effect on the developing world. In the global financial crisis, as you know, Lionel, the, the developing world actually became a supportive engine of growth. Um, now I'm concerned not only about the health effects, but also the economic effects a lot of their economies have gotten hammered. I think financially, some of them had an inflow from central banks, but some of that, that money is quite risky. Um, if you think about the effects on tourism and remittances and some of the, even the trade finance world, uh, we, we could lose a decade for many developing countries. I hear I'm not talking about China. And so again, you know, as part of the recovery strategy, I can see that would be in the US interest to not only help with sort of vaccine distribution, and part of this is not just the vaccine, it's how you distribute it, and the United States has some capacity to do that. But frankly, I would try to work with the IMF and World Bank, and by the way, this may be a place to work with China in a less confrontational context where everyone benefits. Yeah, um, we have a question from Connie Chen, which is please address the currency war. I wasn't actually sure there was a currency war, but more importantly, the 2020 elections. And here, I have a question for uh, directly to you, Bob, as in your wearing your capacity as uh, your hat as someone who's worked on presidential election campaigns, who actually indeed uh, I can uh, reveal played a, quite an important role in the contested 2000 election, um, went down to Florida. Um, it could get very messy in November, um, but more important, Elections can lead to very heated rhetoric and promises made, which are perhaps difficult to keep. Think of the missile gap in 1960. So question for you, how worried should we be if the rhetoric increases and, and rash promises are made? Are they easy to walk back on or are candidates committed by what they say on the stump? Well, these are unusual times. I mean, I mean, I, it's obvious, but they're exceptionally unusual. And um, frankly, I, I, I wish some of the commentators as well as President Trump would recognize there's something larger here than, than just the candidates in terms of the system. Um, and so I'm, I am concerned about the conduct of the election and I hope that the institutions in the system uh, including those people, part of the administration, uh, take that constitutional oath quite seriously and responsibly. As for the, the, uh, the language conducting the, or the policy, um, I think the most effective presidents have a sense of their connection with the voter and where they can make adjustments and where they can't. Um, I touch on this a little bit ironically with, with Reagan when he was dealing with the, with the notion of, of, of the, the Star Wars missile defense and why he couldn't yield that because he had a sense he, that that was part of his 
commitment to the American people in terms of their ultimate security, whatever you believed in the system. I think George Bush 41, who I work for, didn't fully appreciate kind of the, the, the effect of his breaking the no tax pledge. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was for an understandable reason. He was going to war. He wanted to, tear, to deal with the budget. Um, but that's part of the task of a, of a skilled political leader. I think the, the greater challenge actually, though, Lionel, would be given the agenda that I outlined, it'll be very important, for example, if Biden wins, to have a disciplined sequence process. In other words, I've, I've, I've mentioned uh, a large set of issues. But remember, when Reagan came in in 1981 and Baker was the chief of staff, he said, Mr. President, you've got three priorities, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. And so I, I think one of the challenges for the transition team for Biden is realizing how they can put points on the board, how they can get successes, how they can build confidences across that different agenda and have success breed success, another sort of, uh, sort of Baker principle. And as I've suggested, I think there's ways you can actually connect that to your international agenda. So my greater worry is that if you look at the history of Democratic presidents that come in after Republican rule, um, whether it be Carter or Clinton or Obama, particularly if they take control of the Congress, expectations are very high. They don't, they can't judge it effectively what they can accomplish. And within two years, they get a very bad setback. And so I think that would be the challenge for a Biden presidency. There's a question here from um, Lawrence Sullivan from Adelphi University. Prior to President Nixon's visit to the PRC in 72, CBS ran a program, Misunderstanding China, which described all the cultural, racial, and historical misinterpretations of China over the years. Uh, have, has the US got any better um, uh, at understanding China and what might be done? Um, and then I've got one last question. Well, I'd like to think too, but I, but I think it remains a big problem. So here I, I'll just, I'll, uh... I recall my, my point about the pendulum of U.S. relations and trying to get convert China to the, what we want it to be. Um, and I think, you know, part they're, they're, one of the aspects of this even today that I would think about is when you look at Xi's policies, um, you know, keep in mind in Chinese history, uh, the end of dynasties were signaled by natural disasters, earthquakes, plagues, floods, uh, fires. Um, this didn't escape President Xi. <laughs> and so I think one of the reasons you had such a robust response was that uh, he realized this was a critical moment for his dynasty. I think we're now in a situation where we have an odd combination. I think he feels he missed the bullet. So in a sense, there's a sense of confidence, maybe even hubris. But at the same time, I'm suggesting there's an underlying insecurity here. So part of going back to the idea of shaping a policy towards China or any other country, it's useful to think not only what you would want, but it's also useful to understand how they view their position, how they view their history, which also affects obviously uh, China's view of the world. Um, and, uh, and recognize that if you're trying to get things done, uh, you, you can take on those issues, but you're best if you're aware of how to try to nudge the other party towards mutual interests. And at the level of public opinion in the United States, you know, this goes back to the leadership issue. The US, uh, US public was not so hostile to China until the past few years. And now we've seen the, the pendulum move. So frankly, in a practical, uh, to be much more negative. In a practical sense, if I were coming in a new administration, I'd try to urge the Chinese to work with the US to find some common ground on dealing with pandemics, on climate change, on say debt with developing countries. Again, in my model, results matter. And how can you use the practical success to start to rebuild some of the confidence that these two powers need to work together? Bob, we have a, a good question from Michael um, about the pivot, um, which occurred in the Obama administration a pivot both politically and military to Asia. Um, where do you see this pivot uh, heading? Uh, what benefits so far have you seen for America? And 
crucially, how is it affecting other countries in the region? I'm thinking particularly of our mutual friends in the Commonwealth, Australia. That's my question. So uh, I, I think the concept of pivot uh, has been overwhelmed by uh, the Trump approach of confrontation and conflict. Um, but as for observing something about the pivot, I think what, in some ways, the idea of focusing America's attention and resources on the Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific, of course, made sense then, makes sense now. But I think it overlooked a bit was that, in my experience, part of the United States' strength is that it, it's a global power. So, coming back to the China issue, um, as I described when I talked about a potential relationship with alliance partners, I think Europe will be quite important in the relationship with China over time. And I think the United States is foolish, for example, with the conflicts we've gotten with Germany and, and others. And frankly, I think the role of Britain, this will be another important sort of idea of whether Britain will kind of play, remain an international player. So I think this, the oversimplified view of pivot was we can move away from these other regions. What I always discovered, whether I was dealing with international economic or foreign policy, was that people in Asia wanted to know kind of the perspective of what's going on in Europe. And people in Europe wanted to know what our view was in Asia or the Middle East. And so, as you know, I believe we should start at home with a stronger North American base, which would give us 500 million people and three democracies and a lot of other benefits. But I, I think that the United States cannot see itself as simply focused on, on sort of one region or another. As for the attention we've had with the Indo-Pacific, I think um, the Chinese bullying sort of creates opportunities for the United States to bring people together. But this goes back to needing to understand some of their history and their attitude and their limits. So take India. India is not going to become an alliance partner of the United States. It can become a partner. It can kind of think about how it operates in a balanced term. But its history and its own position in the Cold War, is it, it's going to want to maintain some strategic autonomy. But nevertheless, can we, as part of our diplomacy, work with it? Yes, I think that we can. Um, and so I think in terms of the alliance relations, one of the unfortunate parts about the Trump administration is the fights we get with South Korea about our troop presence and how much they pay and almost making US forces sound like mercenaries. Some of the similar points in, in Japan. The, the pulling out of the trade Trans-Pacific Partnership is obviously a strategic mistake economically as well as in terms of relationships. Um, and on the Australian front, um, I think you know, Australia, at least since World War II, has cast its strategic lot in with the United States, really realizing that the United States will be the guarantor. Uh, I think that's a sensible position, but I think we also should never take our partners for granted. And uh, now and then there's things with Australia that uh, I just think may be sort of gratuitous swipes. And you know, the Thucydides trap is, is the popular Thucydides quote, but I'll give you another one, which was you know, Thucydides uh, uh, said that um, we, we win our, our, our friends by doing them favors, not by asking them. You know, so part of the story of alliance partnerships is being sensitive to how you take account of your other partners. And I don't think we're doing that effectively in the Asia Pacific or Europe. There are some co commentators who believe that we have arrived um, at a hinge point in history, that the end it, we've seen during the Trump administration, the end of, if you like, Dean Acheson, Harry Truman's order, uh, you have an America which has retreat, retreated from its global responsibilities, um, not just in terms of military deployment, but much more important, actually actively disengaging from um, multilateral organizations or the TPP, T TPP for example, um, WHO, um, heavily criticizing the NATO alliance, treating um, longtime allies almost as not just economic rivals, but as foes, lowercase f. So uh, my question for you, Bob, is 
I mean, are we actually seeing the slow disintegration of the West, what we used to know as the West? And how far bad could it get if um, the president, as committed to his current policies, wins a second term? So I wanted to end on an optimistic note. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, Lionel, I, I like to be optimistic, and I believe uh, part of my career has been trying to figure out how to make things work. So what I would try to share with ideas in the book and even some of the closing chapters, I emphasize, you know, traditions that would enable the United States to play a role in the, in the world that I hope that it can. But there's nothing preordained. You know, that's that's at the essence of the public choice and the the nature of the leaders we have and and the, and what we uh, the leaders we choose, and so I would I would I guess I would emphasize that one of my concerns over recent years is we've taken many benefits for granted, uh, and frankly the international order has taken other countries in the international system have taken many of the benefits of this 70 year old order uh, for granted the middle ranking powers are going to find it a very different world if we move back to a world of simple uh, sort of great power competition. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a version of what I also said about, you know, Americans can decide how, they, how China has changed, but let's not forget what we've accomplished with China so that we at least have some sense of baseline of the benefits of cooperation. So uh, if you ask how bad it could get, uh, it can get very nasty. <laughs> and, uh, and so I hope we can avoid uh, that type of international outcome. And I guess where, where I keep closing on a bit of optimism is that I hope people understand it, there's a big debate, for example, about uh, globalization. And I try to draw a distinction between globalization and fact and the governance of globalization. And what I mean by that is in a world of a pandemic, do we think biological security issues are just going to go away from national borders? You know, I was speaking with one of the world's leading virologists, and he said, we get about five viruses a year like this. You know, and one of the things we better watch now more closely is wildlife trafficking. So whether it be economic issues, biological security issues, cybersecurity issues, proliferation issues, uh, environmental topics, I think those are going to force their way on, onto people's minds and agenda. And so the, the challenge is always in a democratic system is who will be the coalescing, coalescing catalytic leaders that bring that together. And the reason I write books like this is to try to uh, urge people to think in those terms. We, we do have a little bit more time, Bob, and I, I didn't want to close on a, on a dark note because you are, as I've known uh, for more than three decades, um, a realistic, uh, uh, a cautious optimistic, a realist optimist, a, a realist, uh, but also an optimist. Um, do you think there is a case for an incoming uh, democratic president to reach across the aisle and uh, have one or two uh, Republicans, not just token people, in as a sign of, uh, uh, of greater unity? Or do you think that's just tokenism and wouldn't work? I'm not close enough to their thinking. I think on the Democratic uh, administration, they're going to they're going to have a major coalition management issue because uh, it's always the case in any administration. But on top of that, given Biden's age, a lot of the fights over appointments and policy are going to be fights over the future of the Democratic Party as well as uh, over the sort of individual issues. I think the better opportunity, Lionel, is that, um, you know, Biden is a very skilled legislative player. I mean, he's probably got more legislative experience than any president since LBJ. LBJ, yeah. And, and frankly, from what I saw during the Obama administration, when the Obama administration uh, really did want to try to negotiate with some of the Republicans in Congress, he was often the key person to do so. And I think those would be his instincts. So I think actually, I will partly reverse the question. I think he'll try to work with some of the Republicans in Congress. And the question will be is whether some of the Republicans in Congress will be willing to work with him or whether, as often happens with parties that suffer defeats, is whether they will simply try to coalesce through opposition. Um, you know, there's a number of members of the Senate, you know, who have said positive things. 
you know, Lindsey Graham, who's, you know, in a big electoral fight, said he's not going to be criticizing Biden. He's a person he could work with. So I think that will be another aspect for the world to watch uh, as, as they put together their initial policy. But to give you a practical insider's view, as I said, discipline, prioritization, sequencing, these will be very important. So frankly, I would watch closely who gets selected as chief of staff and who gets selected as national security advisor. Because as my book shows in different periods, including looking back at the LBJ period, those are some of the key positions that actually is around a president enough to have a sense of his or her moods and try to sort of steer them. So those will be key appointments. And as you also say in the book, Bob, it doesn't necessarily work if you just go for glitz and big names with big egos as Kennedy did in his administration, uh, where foreign policy was reduced to just, it all comes down to crisis management. Um, but, but on a more optimistic note, and in closing, I was just going to say, fascinating book, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, Bob. So we didn't discuss Charles Evans Hughes, but I'll point out that chapter, think about right after Wilson's defeat, and he's a good example of what you're talking about. I have the unenviable task today of actually having to put an end to this incredibly wonderful discussion. But uh, Lionel and Bob, I mean, it's just been absolutely riveting. And I've noticed that our audience has remained virtually constant throughout just to show that you've had them mesmerized. I mean, some of the pearls, you know, China's final chapter is not written, as Bob said. Absolutely. We often lose sight of the fact that China is constantly changing, talking about the lower productivity uh, that's going to result if we go through this decoupling. I mean, absolutely. I think the audience is, is, agrees with you on that. I promised I would show this book. It's really a wonderful, it's a wonderful read. I feel like Bob took me by the hand and walked me through almost 250 years of of American diplomatic history. Though I have to say, Bob, I started getting nervous when I got to the end of the book because I worried that the book wouldn't celebrate um, the historic speech that you gave at the National Committee 15 years ago this Monday, that the responsible stakeholder speech that you and, you and Lionel referred to but I need not have worried because on page 468, four pages from the end, there was. Like the speech at our gala, Bob's book, in a way, lifts the spirits. Because he, he describes times when we had thoughtful, engaged leaders, and we led the world in doing constructive things. I'm left with the final quote in the last page of the book, where Bob quotes de Tocqueville, the greatness of America lies in not being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. And boy, that's a message that resonates today. But it's an absolute terrific book. Lionel, Bob I, Bob, I can't thank you enough for writing the book and for giving that speech 15 years ago and doing a, two programs with us in the last few months. And Lionel, thank you so much for doing a fabulous job moderating. Here is the book. If you haven't bought it, buy it. But thank you all for, for joining us today. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Lionel. Thanks to your audience. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Steve.